Hello, and welcome to this talk uh, given by me and my colleague, uh, Matthew Nisley, titled The Pluvial Universe, a Prolegomenon on a Shared Cosmology in the Tanzanian Rift. So the Tanzanian Rift is a large area of the north central Tanzania in which speakers of different language phyla, as well as the language isolate Hadza, have been in contact for a long time. And while language contact has been persuasively argued, questions about the social and political nature of contact between speakers of these languages remain largely unaddressed. One emerging hypothesis is that the peoples of the Tanzanian Rift developed and maintained contact through overarching cosmologies of physical, spiritual, and environmental restoration, frequently mediated through the metaphors and practices related to rain. This talk provides an interdisciplinary survey of the existing evidence in support of such a hypothesis and outlines the first steps in initial inquiries. So the layout of this talk looks like this. Following the establishment of some contexts on the authors, on the Tanzanian Rift, and on rain in East Africa, we will then explore the emerging hypothesis of the rain cosmologies, looking at it from an archaeological, linguistic, as well as an anthropological lens. We'll then talk about the preliminary steps on a path to further pursuing this hypothesis and what we've seen so far. We'll then conclude. To start, I'd like to provide a bit of context about who we are. I'm pictured to the left here with uh, Gorwa language consultant Raheli Lawi. I'm a linguist interested in the languages of the Tanzanian Rift, their documentation and description, their morphosyntax, and the histories and cultures of their speaker communities, especially as evinced through linguistic arts and language contact. I've been conducting language documentation in this part of Tanzania since around 2012, and the speaker communities with whom I work are primarily Gorwa, Ihanzu, and Hadza. My colleague Matthew, pictured here to the right showing off a Sandawe bow, is an archaeologist with a broad interest in the Sandawe people, another group of the Tanzanian Rift, also uh, with an interest in the concept of cultural landscapes, as well as the nature of pre-colonial production and exchange. And he's worked with the Sandawe community on archaeology projects, as well as projects related to ethnobotany. The Tanzanian Rift is an area of north-central Tanzania corresponding more or less to the area within the red circle here. From a geographical perspective, there are no real boundaries or barriers keeping peoples from moving in and out. The Tanzanian Rift can be characterized by its considerable diversity. Languages from at least four different language phyla are spoken here and have probably been spoken here for a long period of time. Different groups structure their relations to each other in a wide array of different ways, so from strong patrilineal patterns to others characterized by matrilineality and even possibly matrilocality. In addition, Food-getting regimes are also varied. Sedentary farming, pastoralism, as well as hunting and gathering, and combinations of each of these are all represented. In addition to this, and perhaps most relevant for our talk today, the area is also characterized by high degrees of cultural contact. This can be seen in the languages, cultures, and histories of all of the groups living in and around the rift. I'd like now to talk about rain in terms of its history in the Tanzanian Rift. This might sound surprising as rainfall in many ways seems like something immutable, a bit like a landform. In fact, even the recent history of rain, that is within the past 5,000 years or so, is characterized by change. For our purposes, we might start at around 5,500 years ago, a period described as the Holocene Humid Optimum. This was characterized by much wetter conditions in the Tanzanian Rift, as well as in places much further afield. Large swathes of the Sahara were grassland, 
Lake Chad was a mega lake over 10 times larger than its current size. Rain from this period makes up the oldest ice currently on top of Mount Kilimanjaro. From this point, the trend was one of drying, to the point that around 3,000 years ago, many lakes of Kenya's Rift Valley, which is contiguous with the Tanzanian Rift, such as lakes Naivasha, Nakuru, and Elmantaita, were entirely dry. Along with this drying came the retreat of forest cover and its uh, replacement by grassland. It's theorized that the retreat of the forests and the tsetse fly habitat that they provided allowed for the southern migration of pastoralist peoples from northern Kenya south into places possibly including the Tanzanian Rift. And then, only after all of that, at around 2,000 years ago, did the pattern of bimodal rains, seasons oscillating between rainy and dry, come to characterize East Africa. I'd like now to turn to an examination of our rain cos cosmologies hypothesis by means of examining three different types of evidence, the first being archaeological. My co-presenter Matthew's work, both through existing site reports as well as original archaeological work in the Tanzanian Rift, has, first of all, identified that uh, petroglyphs, or rock carvings, are considerably more widespread in this part of East Africa than originally assumed. Furthermore, and as this map shows, petroglyphs are often found in association with rock art, that is, drawings uh, often made with pigment on stone. The narrative that Matthew sees emerging is that there is a pattern of these sites featuring petroglyphs and rock art being very old indeed, often outliving the original inhabitants of a given area, but being reinterpreted and re-inscribed by later inhabitants with later cultures as sacred spaces through practices associated with regeneration and well-being. A fascinating example of this is the case of the so-called cave drums. In many of these sites, which are often rock shelters, there are large drums. Universally, the current inhabitants of the area say that these drums were not made by them, but were left there by an unknown predecessor population. Nevertheless, these drums are, by each community, still put to use in rituals which involve bringing rain, restoring fertility, or otherwise encouraging collective or individual well-being. Drums in Alagua communities seem to be under the custodianship of the Rainmaker clan, whereas relations with the drums in Sandawe communities seem less proprietary. Cave drums in Ihanzu communities play a part in the rainmaking tradition of the royal uh, lineage. In all cases, communities' relationships to these artifacts are different, but united by their connection to this larger cosmology of rain. Finally, the, in the image of the cave drum to the left, a carving of a snake can be picked out along the length of the instrument. It's striking to note that the python has been associated with practices of identity making further to the north near Lake Nyanza or Lake Victoria. This practice is dated at approximately a thousand years old. Now, whether these drums are of that age or not is not really the point. The point is that there appears to be a long distance pattern of some sort of cultural continuity, one that spans both place and time. In ways somewhat similar to archaeological evidence, linguistic evidence is another way we can trace social and political histories. I'd like to examine three examples here. So first of all, Gorwa, a South Cushitic language spoken in the Tanzanian Rift, has the verb tseis. Uh, not only does tseis mean to cool off, it also means to heal or to get better. The same polysemy exists for the Bantu Rift Valley language Ihanzu. The verb kupola also means to cool off or to heal or to get better. This is, in fact, a rather widespread pattern in the region, and those of us familiar with Swahili will also recognize it. A second, somewhat congruent example lies in that of the word for sorcerer, though this requires a bit more description. 
So the word for sorcerer in Gorwa is da'alusumo. In Ihanzu, the word for sorcerer is mosonso. Now, on a formal level, these two words bear no resemblance. But when we look at their etymology, we can again see a similarity. The Gorwa word for sorcerer is based on the verb da, which means to burn. And the Ihanzu word for sorcerer is also based on the verb for to burn, which in that language is kosonsa. In both languages, the sorcerer, a harmful individual associated with sickness, is an individual associated with burning or fire. Contrast this to the words for healing, which I'll show once again, which are polysimus with cooling. A third example takes us a bit further afield. Ihanzu has the word nsimpulia, a noun meaning a rain ritual. Given the cultural salience of this word, I'd like to take a look at its possible etymology in detail. First, could it be related to the word for rain, mbola, in Ihanzu? Well, when we look at the reconstructions in Proto-Bantu, there are two forms of interest, the first being the noun buda for rain, and the second being the verb pod for to cool down or to get well. On formal grounds, it looks like the ultimate edamon for simpolia is pod. But even given this match, there are still questions to answer here. We'll remember that the Ihanzu word for to cool off or to heal is, uh, at least contemporarily, kopola. And even if we grant this change in vowel quality from um, a, a current O to a U vowel, that still leaves us with this sim morpheme highlighted here to explain. The initial N uh, can be explained as a noun class marker, and the ya suffix here looks like some sort of verbal ending, perhaps an applicative on what is now a verbal noun. Given the lack of any similar morphology for this sim morpheme in Ihanzu, the best explanation I can currently give uh, for this morpheme is a class 10 noun prefix in the Bantu languages of the Western Serengeti, something like che with uh, an optional n. Here, you can see the current day location of Ihanzu in the red circle, and the current locations of the Western Serengeti languages in the larger uppermost circle. There is currently a 200 kilometer gap or so between both language communities today, but given that gap is formed by the Serengeti National Park, which wasn't always there and has only been there quite recently, one might assume that these language communities were located much closer to each other in the you know, relatively recent past. So returning to the form, what then does it mean if this Ihanzu word for rain ritual has been borrowed from a Western Serengeti language. There is no evidence that Ihanzu is closely related to these languages, other than all of them being members of the larger Bantu family, but perhaps this represents a history of ritual connection between the Ihanzu people and rainmakers further afield, another piece in a larger picture characterized by a connecting cosmology of rain. The anthropological and historical literature also provides considerable evidence supporting widespread rain cosmologies across the immediate area, including descriptions of rainmaking traditions among the Nyaturu and Mbugwe peoples, as well as groups further afield, including the Gogo and the Pare peoples. More importantly, however, is the evidence provided of the considerable trans-ethnic nature of these practices. Gorwa rainmakers trace their lineage back to Ihanzu rainmakers, and Ihanzu rainmakers are described as owners of the land, which is another title given to the nearby Hadza people by the Ihanzu. Accounts of people of different ethnic groups often seeking the intervention of particular specialists and often traveling considerable distances is, they're also well represented. The image we are looking at now is that of Puma with the rocky outcrop of Tita, the largest of them all, towards the center of this image. 
In the 1967 article from which this image comes, the rain shrine at Tita, its history, and the nature of the rain rituals carried out there is explained in brief. And once again, the focus on the cooling essence of rain, the economic centrality of ensuring rain falls when it is meant to fall and in proper measure, as well as the connection to various peoples of various contemporary ethnicities, as well as historical antecedent populations. Part of answering these questions about rain in the Tanzanian Rift lies in listening to the peoples of the Tanzanian Rift themselves, allowing them to teach us about their understandings and visions, both historical and contemporary, of their universes and their places in them. One step in this, in, in this direction is a project I'm currently undertaking to translate and transcribe extant recordings associated with rain, rainmaking, fertility, and healing. These rain texts will then be made available as a collection of narratives, histories, and personal accounts, which speak to each other and help us understand elements of this pluvial universe from the perspective of local people. So, for example, one exciting detail emerging is the symmetries that exist between Ihanzu and Gorwa rainmaking ritual practices. Here, an Ihanzu woman on the left and a Gorwa man on the right both describe the process of farmers obtaining a knife from the local rainmaker in order to harvest their first crops. Hadza speakers also describe their connections to rainmaking practices and rainmakers, a detail which has, to this point, not been described in anthropological accounts of the Hadza people. Archaeological, linguistic, and anthropological evidence has, to date, often focused on two scales. The scale of highly focused attention to a single, often ethnically defined group, or large-scale, continent-wide overviews. Such approaches have often resulted in the entrenchment of people into concepts such as tribe, language family, or subsistence type. Working with similar data, but often in different ways, we submit that examination at the scale of what may be seen as a cultural or political area allows us to see the complex series of interactions that took place and continue to take place among people and tell stories of how visions of the universe and practices associated with the land have been the basis for production and exchange over a wide area and across deep spans of time. Thank you, and here are our acknowledgments.